difficult. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So That's okay. A professional term. Okay, we're we're straight into the lecture, and um, and I'm going to cut everybody off the side of the screen. My end. Uh, those that are aware, these lectures are um, recorded at this uh, as we stand. Um, and I would like to say that anyone would like to join us on Friday between one o'clock and two um, in my um, online YouTube discussion, um, then they'll be very welcome to join us tomorrow. There, there is one thing when we did the online discussion last Friday, it seemed to go extremely well. This week we've got much better technology. Now let's go straight into the Incan civilization. I, I did say to you all off, um, off the recording that um, the destruction of the Incan civilization is, I believe, not at the hands of the Spanish conquistadors. They came in um, into the scene a little bit after the Incan civilization was already in full collapse. But we will, um, we will see where we go with that and Atahualpa, and we will look at the wonderful victory that the Inca had um, over the Spanish at um, Ayata, Oya Tambo. Um, so this is going to be one of those lectures that I'm going to have to probably um, correct myself throughout, um, even though I've gone overboard in trying to pronounce Atalwapa. Um, so the Incan civilization, uh, we would say that the Incan civilization came to an end abruptly, or did it? In my very notes in front of me at the top, um, being unbiased, it says the Incan Empire came to an end when it was conquered by the Spanish Empire. The empire was actually already weakened um, when the Spanish arrived because the Inca had been involved in an intense civil war between Huasca and Atahualpa, um, the two sons of the previous great emperor um, over a succession to the throne that began in 1528. Um, now, um, that's where we're going to begin. And through a number of things that we've already spotted, uh, we've, we've spotted um, that it's, a, it's highly unlikely that the Spanish um, um, did have a dramatic effect over the collapse of the Incan Empire due to lack of food on the Spanish army side. Uh, the fact that um, extensively the, um, the Spanish army would have suffered um, from the tropical diseases um, also, the Incan army was probably extremely small at that stage anyway. Um, there was an absolute massive technological decline in Incan technology um, in the 1500s. Um, and also, it's very unlikely that the Spanish um, scored a direct victory over the Inca because the guns that they were using at that time, the hand cannons, probably took about three minutes to load. Um, and at that point, the enemy's already on you and you're dead. So um, hopefully I can actually cover all those issues. Now, um, Francisco Pizarro is the figure that really comes into history here. And, but before he really comes into history, um, what we need to do, we need to discuss some of the images that you're seeing in front of you. And no doubt Ellen will be asking where the hell um, the Inca civilization is, even though we all know it's South America, but we, where the hell it is, is a rather interesting question. The structure that you can actually see in front of you um, is one of a number of pre-1500s Incan type um, temples, homes, uh, that were constructed by this wonderful empire that started in 1230. Um, and ranged all the way up until the 1620s. Anyone that says that Fran um, um, Francisco Pizarro completely obliterated and destroyed the Incan um, Empire within four years uh, is on another planet, um, simply because it's been overstated uh, the effect that the Spanish had on the Incan world. And this is one thing I'd like to solve today. But this, this is the masonry that you're looking at up until about the 1500s. Very fine masonry. The usual thing that I would hear from people is this type of masonry is a type of masonry that you couldn't put a neat knife in between the joints. That's true. You couldn't really put a credit card in between the joints. That's true. But later on from the 1500s, probably more like um, somewhere in about the, the 1520s towards the 1530s, the te technology um, in the Incan world um, completely collapsed in the way they're building. So that gives you an idea that with a collapse in civilization, there's less manpower. And then that brings you on to the other uh, question, what about diseases? Which, which are also two other massive questions. 
Now, um, years and years ago, um, women have this effect on you, don't they, Keith? Years and years ago, in, in the year 1997, I had an opportunity of, of going to Machu Picchu. Um, I, I was going to meet up with this wonderful woman called Fernanda, um, a Brazilian woman, um, and she was going to um, take me um, from Sao Paulo um, on the train all the way to the Incan Trail, and we were going to go up to this site. Unfortunately, I was actually seeing um, I, I was actually seeing a woman at that stage who who, who um, got pregnant, and it stopped me going. What what things women do to you, Keith? You know they they. <laughs> They entrap you. So I, I never ever they went. They do, they do. They, they do. Women, they, they get pregnant to sort Nasty of. Nasty things that they are. They, they are. They keep, they keep them, you with them. You know, they, they, they force you to make them pregnant. Terrible they just want control, like that. don't they? That's exactly. the thing with women. I think, Keith, you and I need to shut up now. <laughs> Luckily, they're all muted. Oh, God, I'm, th I'm so pleased Kathy's muted. Can you imagine the amount of... Um, uh, yeah, exactly. But I think Kathy would uh, agree with you that women are controlling and um, all the rest of it. So, um, but anyway, um, so when we've got such a, a lot to look at, and, and um, hopefully I can get through it all, I've actually cut half my lecture because I realise that um, I don't need the other half a lecture notes. We we will be looking at this wonderful site, Machu Picchu, and that's that's a reminder what we're doing on Friday. Um, we will be looking at Machu Picchu, but not not from um, not really from a historical point of view. We'll be looking at a, from a, an archaeological point of view um, in comparison to do with my notes. Um, Francisco Pizarro landed in Peru in 1532 with 168 men and 62 horses. And Atlahuapa was advised to kill them, probably because um, he was fully aware that 11 years earlier, the conquistador um, Fernando Cortes um, um, invaded the um, Aztec um, Empire, um, brought the Aztec Empire to its knees. Um, the ensuing um, diaspora meant that millions and millions of people associated with the Aztec Empire from 1521 to about 1525 were now dead. And obviously the Inca were fully aware of this. The Inca did not regard the conquistadors as anything special. They did not regard them as gods. They regarded them as, as evil people. And evil people carry diseases, and that's where we stop. Um, sneezes cause diseases, um, and it's quite appropriate that more or less all the lectures that we've been doing recently have a link with the sense of the modern day pandemic. Um, ve very much, very much to think of is is probably from about 1321-ish to about 1325, there were links drawn up with the Incan world. The Incan world was not in complete isolation, as some historians like us to believe. Francisco Pizarro didn't turn up with a very small army, a couple of um, uh, land cannons and a load of hand cannons of folk with horses. He didn't just turn up for no reason at all. Pizarro was very aware that the Incan empire was at its knees, and this was the point of time to hit the Incan world. Um, what you will see is the, what you will see, now this is on my tick, tack, um, tick list, what you will see is the, the Spanish right of written history. They will say that there was 100,000 Incas, uh, Incan soldiers on a battlefield um, trying to stop them conquering the Incan world. And 168 men and 62 horses were able to wipe out 100,000 Incan soldiers. And actually, that is very much impossible. And the reason why it's impossible, you look at the likes of um, Islandawana, uh, where the uh, British mission was thankfully wiped out by the Zulus at Islandawana, where you've got the, the massacre of uh, 1,700 plus British soldiers uh, wiped out at Islandawana by an enemy that was armed with nothing but spears. Now, if 20,000 Zulus can do that to a well-trained army that is very much in, in awe of using their weapons, very well-trained, I'm sure that um, even 10,000 Inca could have wiped out the Spanish, um, even with the advantage of the cannons that the Spanish had and the horses. But when you think about it, the army of Atlahapa was probably very, very small probably in the means of in the hundreds rather than in the tens of thousands. Um, and the other thing as well is an army 
of 100,000, an army of 10,000, an army of 6,000, along those very narrow roads would have stretched out hundreds, if not a thousand miles to actually get to the point of conflict. Um, and when you think about it, you've got to feed an army like that. And an army marches on its stomach. And when an army doesn't have anything to eat, there you go. Sorry, I'm sounding very dictatorial today. And I'm, I'm sounding as if my word is gospel. But my word is not going to be gospel today. We're going to actually look at the archaeological evidence. You're going to go away from here today and actually think about some of this yourself. Now, this is, this is that Incan technology, that high Incan technology that, um, that I'm sure Karen has photographs of and I'm sure Sue has images of as well. This very high technology acted very much in a, um, a vulcanized area, seismic zone. So as there's any seismic activity associated with the An um, Andean Ridge um, and the trench, which is just off the coastline there, um, all that movement would have meant that the buildings would have shuddered every now and again. And with any modern buildings, um, any earthquake would have decimated. At, at this building that I'm living in today, the building that you're living in, Keith, if that was standing in, in the Incan world back then, one earthquake tremor would be down at your knees and you would be dead. Uh, but Incan buildings, that didn't occur to Incan buildings. Incan, the, the way these, these stones worked was that they go up, they go down, they go left and right, they go back and forward. And then after the uh, earth tremors are finished, it all sits down. Uh, Akalwapa's world is back to normal again. However, um, things were changing at Akalwapa's time. Um, after the great victory of Oroska um, in, um, in the year 1532. This was to be the last of the um, great, or you could say um, feeble leaders of the Incan world because he was not um, of a great mind. And we will tell you why in a moment. So here we go. Um, and to be honest with you, anyone that's got anything that they would like to say other than what I've already said, keep it for the break whilst we're doing those images. One thing that we do know about the Incan world is that the victors um, wrote the history. They also artisized the history. They also, they, 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 they made the Inca to look like absolute idiots and, and brutish thugs. Um, and at, when, we, when we look at the great uh, victory at um, Oyatambo, Oya Ta um, when we look at that great victory that the Inca had um, over the Spanish, uh, we start to think that the, the Inca were able to do great things. Um, and because of that victory um, um, in 1537, um, five years after Pizarro landed, the Incan world was able to survive for um, quite some decades until about 1620. It, I will not give credit for the um, destruction of the Incan world at the hands of 168 men, horses, um, I would like to give the, the destruction of the Incan world at the hands of disease and, and a taboo word, enslaving um, the Incan civilization to be used in expeditions in North America. And, and my God, if I said that um, to anybody in North America, uh, they would be in, up in arms. But those people who founded North America um, at the hands of the Spanish were the Incan from South America. Um, and we can look at the history for that and we, look, we can look at the archaeology for that as well. It was not those um, Africans that were responsible for building North America with the Inca. But then again, you can agree and disagree on that as much as you like. So again, another image of Machu Picchu. And there we go. Uh, just, before, just before the wonderful Ellen leaves us. Now, let's think about this. Let's just think about this logically. Um, and I'm going to think about this um, in a roundabout way. So let's get my um, annotation up there. So when we look at this, this is absolutely, this is absolutely quite a big empire. It's quite huge. Uh, it's a really, really big empire. From north to south, you're looking at over 2,000 miles. Uh, you're looking at the Andy Range. Um, you're looking at this river here um, that was eventually found by a Spanish explorer as part of the expedition later on. Um, and what we, what we do have is, when we look at this, this, this covers um, um, Ecuador, um, it covers Peru, um, it covers Chile, um, it goes into uh, Brazil as well. This, this, is, this, is a, this is a nation, this is, this is a very firm empire. And one thing that I forgot on Tuesday night, and I will tell you as, 
I will tell you now that any empire that grows quickly is an empire doomed to destruction at its own hands. Um, and when I say that doomed to destruction at its own hands, you look at the Roman Empire. It rose very quickly uh, between the period of Julius Caesar, um, 56 BC, all the way to um, Claudius, looking at AD 43, period of 100 years. Um, an empire that rose quite quickly. Yeah, up until that point, you know, the, the Roman world was pretty small, right? It'd been small for a long time. That's why it lasted. It grew quite quickly. Um, and it went stagnant, just like the Incan world. It went stagnant. Civil wars, just like the Roman world. You see, you see those links there. And in, a, in, in some ways, in some ways um, this can be the epitome. This can be where humanity goes. When we looked at the First World War last week, I said once or twice that we had got to a technological height. We had got to a Seneca collapse. We had got to a Europe where Europe was at peace. We had got to a Europe where people were starting to invent um, flying aircraft that could take groups of people from one locality to another. We had cars on roads. We, we had battleships um, that, that were nothing compared with anything before. We, we had machine guns that could take hundreds of people down at any point in time. We had sanitation, electricity, we had gas, we had everything. And suddenly, humanity dared to destroy it in a great war that was absolutely pointless. And in a way, this is what we see with the Inca. Now, when we started, we all heard, we all heard um, Karen talk, talking, you know, about the um, mummies. She was talking about the wonderful buildings. She was talking about the great parts of the Incan world. But one, thing's, one thing is, one thing when you look at the Incan world is the part of the Incan world that was in decline. We also look at the Aztec world as well. Um, two points to be made here. The Aztec world, um, if Cortes hasn't got to the Aztec world when he did in 1521, it's very likely the Aztec world would have collapsed within a decade anyway. The Incan world, the Incan world was, was in the height of a major civil war. Um, towns and cities were destroyed, roadways destroyed, sanitation systems destroyed, and then walks in the Spaniard. No, no wonder the Spaniards take the credit, as they did with everything. Um, but if, if the Incan empire hadn't have, hadn't have collapsed when it did, it would have taken 20 years and it would have completely, or it would have had links with the Japanese. And if it would have had, now what we do see is there's possibility that Japanese traders were now hitting North America. Um, and if they managed to get to the um, South America, they may have introduced gunpowder. And could you imagine what that would have done to the Spanish? The Spanish destroyed, um, like the Ethiopians uh, destroyed the Italian army at Adawa um, just before the end of the 1900s, an army armed with spears, destroying um, a mechanized army from the West. Um, this, is, this would have been another one of those bits of history. But again, as I said last week, it was not to be. These moments in history were not to be. They never happened. I did not have a time machine to go back and, and give the Inca a machine gun. And they could have wiped out the um, Cortes in one moment. However, not Cortes, um, um, Francisco Pizarro in one moment. You know, so I can't go back and change time. That, that's doing talking quick. I make those mistakes, um, Keith, trying to get all this information. In. <laughs> and, and do, do, you know, do you know what Kathy's going to say? She's going to say, I didn't like that lecture very much. You were talking too fast, um, Carl. But then again, I've got a lot to cover. But this is where I slow down a little bit. It was believed by the generals advising Atahualpa that um, Francisco Pizarro was not a god. He was just an evil man. And why was he classed as evil? At that point, the people of the West would have been associated with diseases. Disease, um, sneezes caused diseases. And these diseases were quite terrible diseases. Um, they were the influenza that we take for granted in the Western world. No jokes about the pandemic. Um, smallpox, typhus, very nasty. Measles, again, a killer. Diphtheria, a killer. Um, all these things had already been introduced by the Incan world, devastating the Incan world. The Incan world itself was a world that was linked by extensive roadways. 
and any disease coming in from the north would have spread down to the south within, within days. You could go from the north of the Incan world to the south of the Incan world in around 70 days. If some, you, can, you can imagine that, that the whole strip of land in 70 days by foot and a llama. Um, and, and if anyone wants to say um, that the Inca didn't really have the wheel, the Inca were aware of the wheel, but they didn't need them. Um, so let's, let's go on a little bit further. Let's sort of get a little bit more into this. So here we go, this wonderful map. If anyone, um, if anyone wants to write this down, Olya to uh, Tambo at the bottom there, um, south of Machu Picchu. Uh, we've got um, Kayamaka, which is rather important. Um, and what we, what we do find is that Pizarro is landing along this coastline. Yeah, he's landing along this coastline with ships which would not have come from the south, but ships which would have come from the north. Basically, by this stage, the Spanish were building ships on the western seaboard um, of the coast past Panama. So they were, they, they, ships were being constructed. And basically, all you would have needed was two ships, a supply vessel um, and a vessel for the horses and men. So there you go. Um, what, what, we, what we need to look at, the, what we need to chuck in here is Petiti as well. Petiti is believed to be the missing, um, the missing city of El Dorado, um, but um, but what we would what we would like to um, see is the likes of Machu Picchu, um, um and the other lost city of gold that was actually found because it was offered to him by the people left um, at Cusco. Um, and we will look at that in, in a while, but, but not yet. There's so much to get to. Um, so what I was saying earlier on, let's just cl um, um, scrub the clean, um, screen a bit. Um, when you think about it, there was the empire for 170 years. Nice building, able to build those great structures that Karen and Sue will show us in those wonderful photographs that they got in the break. Um, and then they expanded a little bit. It took them 170 years to expand to this little bit of territory. It's all fine. Every, everything's okay. This is, this is slow expansion. It's all right. And then you expand to about um, 1463 to this area. So at this stage, it's not big. And then suddenly, suddenly, here we go, bang and bang all the way there. And in other words, you expand your empire to a degree that was not sustainable. This was gonna fall. This was gonna fall whatever way you look at it. And why it was gonna fall? Well, it's quite easy that. I'm gonna chuck in their Pax Romana. Anyone that knows Pax Romana will be, will be aware of the term Roman peace. Um, and they will be aware that to have Pax Romana, you go into an area, you get the people on your side, then you invade, people go on your side, they become a province, job done. There's no way you can conquer this territory without death. There's no way that you can, you, that you can take in all these worlds without forceful means. Up until that point, things hadn't been forceful. And this is gonna build up those civil wars, those rebellions, the support of the Spanish. This is, this is what's gonna happen. These are the tragedies of the moment, what's gonna happen. Um, and again, if you want to look at the British Empire, um, I don't care what anyone says, the British Empire um, was really building from about the, the um, late 1700s India, early 1800s, and then it expanded to encompass um, a big chunk of, um, a big chunk, chunk of Africa, big chunks of Asia, and then by about 1780, 1785, we stopped expanding. And then the British Empire become rotten, stagnant, and by 1947, it's over. That is the same model of the Incan world. No matter what way you look at it, no arguments. The British Empire grew too quick. The big British Empire become too big for its boots. And these problems that we see today, um, we, see, we see those problems um, in the likes of 
um, Iran. Uh, we see the problems in the Middle East. We see those problems in, um, in North America and Africa, and we see those problems with protesting and people going on about slavery and all the rest of it. Um, and and you, if you look at the subtext, you start to see that these are forced moments in history. Um, slavery was a bad thing. Slavery was a terrible thing, but people were forced. Uh, it was part of the a big expansion that the British Empire needed or wanted. If the British Empire had gone a bit of a slower pace, we may not have some of those problems today. Keith, I'll bring you in on that. Is that, is that a fair assumption or am I completely wrong? No, that's reasonable. Yeah, it's coming from your view. Yeah. Coming from my disagree view. disagree with that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but what would your view be? <laughs> yeah, very similar, actually. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, do you know, do you know one, one, of those, one of those things I'm, I'm very much trying to do at this minute is just say that, you know, lot, lots, of the, lots of those roots of history go, go either more recent times or they can go extremely, um, or they, they can go extremely deep. Um, so, as I say, we, we've, got, we've got this wonderful um, site at Machu Picchu again, and there is um, something that I've got with my, my um, images at the, in this minute. So um, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk over this um, a second. So when um, Atul uh, Wapa um, was being advised that these people um, that supported Francisco Pizarro were of evil men, Atul Wapa um, Atul Wapa was not sure that Pizarro was in fact evil. He disagreed with his generals. Um, Atalwapa thought that he would give Pizarro a chance. Um, Atalwapa, after all, had heard that um, Pizarro may have actually only come to uh, the Incan world uh, with a white flag. Obviously, they wouldn't have understood a white flag, but with a white flag. So Atalwapa thought, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and meet with, I'm gonna go and meet with Pizarro. And he, the, Incan, the Incan general said, no, please don't meet with Pizarro. Meeting with Pizarro is a very bad thing. Please don't meet with Pizarro. And he said, I'm going to meet with him. I'm a god after all. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think he would have said that, but, you know, I'm the embodiment of God. You know, I'm, 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 I'm really important. You know, I, I, I am the leader of this world. I am the most important being here. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the head of, of everything, you know. You wouldn't have said he's God, but you know, that, that's, that's the sense we've got. You know, I'm so important. So I'm going to meet with Pizarro. Pizarro is going to be nothing like me. I'm, I'm the embodiment of everything this country is. Um, and when he met with Pizarro, he said to his followers, stay back. Um, disarm yourselves. Just stay back. And I'm going to meet with Pizarro. And he met with Pizarro. Um, and it was described that um, Atalapa was quite hospitable, the conquistadors. He was very welcoming. Um, at the same time, the Spanish were, were um, attacking his army. Now, in my notes, it says that the army of Atalapa was 6,000 unarmed men. Now, you know, 6,000 unarmed men would be, would be a match for 168 men. Because when you think about it, leading the um, launch, firing the aquabuses at the time, the hand cannons, needing up to three minutes to reload. Obviously, they, they've done one volley. All you need to do is charge those 6,000 individuals um, at Pizarro's men, and they would have soon been overrun, um, and they would have stood no chance. And actually, I don't believe that this is true. I believe that Atalwapa probably had a small number of followers, maybe 100, maybe 200. Um, they were overcome by the Spanish, um, that leaving Atalwapa alone, isolated. Um, now, this is, this is where history comes into its own, and the written history. Um, the written history tells of, of 6,000 followers of Atalwapa being massacred. Um, I disagree. Um, but who's writing the history? It also says that one single volley and a cavalry charge um, wiped out his followers. 
They probably did because there were probably quite a few of them. At that point, um, a message went to Cusco, the capital, which you can clearly see on your map. And the message going to Cusco was, um, Atalapa has been captured. You are now to pay a ransom. Now, Cusco, uh, Cusco's temples at that stage had walls, floors and ceilings plated in solid gold, sheets of gold. This, this, is, this is gold, this is gold in a finery. Golden pebbles on the floor of the precincts. Um, golden gold plants, um, um, miniature versions of golden llamas and shepherds in, in fields within golden courtyards. All these descriptions that we actually get um, from the Catholic priests later on. Um, and basically, the, the leaders um, at Cusco, the Inca leaders and the general said, well, why do they want gold? We, you know, there's loads of it. All right, then. If that's what they want, then we'll give it to them. Right? We'll just give them whatever gold they want. So it's likely on board 100 alpacas, llamas. Um, uh, they, they, the, 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 the panniers on, on the alpacas and the llamas were, were full of gold. You can imagine hundreds and hundreds of pounds of gold and silver, loads of it on a hundred animals. And these, these were taken all the way from, um, all the way from um, Cusco, all the way down the trail, all the way down to Cayamaca. It was, it was at Cayamaca that Atalwapa was being held. And this is, this is where history comes in to its own. History comes into its own. It's, it's likely that, um, it's very likely that the Inca didn't send an army because they didn't have an army to send because the army had been obliterated through the civil war that the Inca were involved in. So they couldn't really send an army to um, save their emperor. All they could send is these alpacas and llamas with the panniers full of gold and silver. And when they'd actually got to um, Kayamaka, the, um, it, it's, it, Pizarro thought, well, hang on a minute. There's all this gold. Atalwapa is defenseless. He's got no army come to relieve him. Lots of, lots of the local people are ill. The country is very weakened. It's got no defense because of the civil war that obviously Pizarro was fully aware of. That's why he invaded in the first place. Um, so what they did, they killed Atalwapa. They executed him. They didn't return him back to the Inca. They executed him. They got away with him. You know, he was, he was a meaningless figure. They just got rid of him. Um, it said that this devastated the Incan hierarchy. How do we know that the Inca do, didn't have any writing? Um, the way the Inca recorded things was a way of knots. What they would do they, um, to sort of get tallies, they, they would get a rope and they'd put knots in it. And then there'd be an equal distance to say that, that this knot represented this. Another equal distance, two knots represent this and all the rest of it. That's how they recorded things. So, you know, we don't really know what the Inca, Inca thought. But anyway, they were paralyzed anyway. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't resist. Uh, there was no way of resisting. Um, so... Let's look, let's look at the weapons that the um, Spaniards had. Remember, Cayamaca, and remember looking at the, the uh, plan, we're going to come on um, to that. So I'm just going to, hopefully, these images will come up now. It's terrible when this happens. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. Oh. A hand cannon. Mm. Now, as you'll, as you'll be aware, Keith, this is probably a hand cannon from about the uh, 1560s, 1570s. It's not exactly um, an aquabus um, invented by a German um, from the time that we're talking about, the 1520s, 1525. Um, what this would have needed back then is a stand. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to stick a stand on there. A very chunky stand. Uh, and we're going to sit it in the stand. Okay, and you're going to fire once, take two, three minutes to reload, and then you're going to have to take that stand forward, 
again fire. Now this is an impractical weapon. It's also uh, possible that um, Pizarro may have had two land cannons of possibly, um, possibly the boar would have been quite a small boar anyway. Um, probably um, 300 pound, sh um, 300 pound shots, God, three to two pound shots uh, being fired from a cannon. I do believe the Germans ha did have one or two um, artillery pieces that could fire two or 300 pounds in the First World War, but not this stage two to three pound shots. So these would take a time to reload as well. So this is a technology that the Spanish had. The Spanish were also armed. The Spanish were also armed with iron swords. The Spanish also had um, helmets and they had, um, they, they had plate armor on as well. But none of this is gonna be able to resist the tropical diseases. Um, and when I, when I thought about this, when I thought about the whole thing, I've started to realize something quite clear. And what I've started to realize quite clear is that with the distance that you're having to travel from Cuyamaca to Cusco, uh, which is a good distance of at least 600 miles, um, all, the, all the Inca needed to do was to pick off one or two Spaniards every single night. Just, just one, one, one every single night would have been great. They would have lost a few at Cuyamaca. So by the time you get to Cuzco, there would have probably been only a handful of Spaniards with some local support. And the local support would have been matched with the same weapons the Inca had. And I believe, I believe quite, I believe very much that the Inca could not resist of the Spaniards because they could not really put an army into the field. And that's what the evidence is telling me. You know, what, what we're seeing is, is some of the history saying, you know, just outside Cusco, the capital, there, there was a battle and there was a cavalry charge and the, all the Inca ran away. Well, who is actually writing the history? It's certainly not the Inca. So by the time they got to Cusco, wonderful things would have been on display to meet them. So before we actually go there, I've got a list of facts. I've got, I've got, nine, um, I've got nine key facts about the conquest of the Incan Empire. Some will conflict with what I've already said, but I'd like to give you the facts. So, 1532, and one of the facts about the um, Incan Empire the Incan Empire uh, ruled parts of Peru, Ecuador, Chile, Bolivia, and Colombia. Fact one. Within 20 years, the empire was in ruins, and the Spanish were in indisputed, indisputed possession of, of the Inca cities and wealth. Well, actually, that's true, because if there's no resistance, they can just walk into most of these cities and towns, except where the Spanish come a cropper in 1537 when they are finally defeated by the Inca. But that's probably because the Inca are managing to get themselves together. The conquest on the, of the Inca looks un, unlikely on paper. 160 Spaniards against an empire with 12 million subjects. How did Spain do it? Again, I'm not gonna give Spain the credit. I'm gonna give Spain the credit uh, for, the, for the aftermath. In November of 1532, Incan Emperor Atalhapa was captured, as we know. Um, we also know that he was warned not to meet Pizarro. And it's also said that very much the Inca were aware who these Spaniards were, unlike the Aztec. Fact three. The Inca Empire had been collecting gold and silver for centuries, and the Spanish soon found most of it, because they were being given most of it anyway. Um, a great amount of gold was um, even hand-delivered to the Spanish as part of Atal Hapa's ransom that we are aware of. It's said that of the just over 160 men who first invaded Peru with Pizarro, uh, each of them was given at least a million pounds in gold and silver in today's money today. 
a million pounds in wages and that was for the lowliest infantry soldier and the lowliest infantry soldier was given in today's money a million pounds you, you you can't even you can't even match that with any other event in history this would basically be like um the, the british army at waterloo and each of the soldiers coming home with a hundred pounds of, of of gold uh, each which simply didn't happen it said listen to this that each each infantry soldier the lowliest of the low the lowest in a complicated pay scale my notes tell me that they had a hundred pounds of gold and two hundred pounds of silver and i've got to ask you um um keith you know that how the hell would you get that back you know, how could you carry that amount with you and you're in the middle of nowhere effectively do you know what keith then you've spotted another problem who's writing the history and and you start to think some you know what somebody asked me what somebody asked me a couple of days ago they said carl was there really this much gold um in the incan world and i've said yes of course there was that much gold in the incan world look at look about look at the treasure ships that are returning back from uh, Central America, um, which are being then intercepted and all the rest of it. Those treasure ships are, are, are full of gold and silver. But were the men actually divvied out all these amounts of gold and silver? Or is this um, poetic license um, no, on the so. side of the writer? I think so as well. Um, we go on to saying something else, that the Pizarro brothers, there was four of them, ruled the Incan world like the mafia so in that i don't think the lowliest infantry soldier is going to be getting near near that amount of gold um but anyway that's a really good point somebody asked that question but the gold was probably keep being kept into the upper echelons it was being placed on board ships sent back to spain and then you've got the other side of the world um, um the portuguese are sending back gold um and with all this said it is one point it is true whether whether i've read that out that about all the soldiers having a hundred pounds of gold and all the rest of it is true or not one point i would say is between um the year um the year 1530 32 and about 1534 um the world economy was completely altered it was almost as if spain had obtained the wealth of the world um, if you want to have a modern metaphor, um, it would be like Spain suddenly having the entire GDP of the United States, China, Western Europe, all in one day. That's the amount of gold we're talking about um, that the Spanish Empire occurred over four years. But is this all coming from the Incan world? A big question mark, and I can't answer that. Right, uh, this is Atalapa um, that we're looking at now. And the other um, image is his brother. Um, and he, whose name is Oscar. The, um, the soldiers and the people of the Incan Empire um, did not meekly turn over their homeland to the hated invaders. Major Inca generals um, did fight pitch battles against the Spanish when they were starting to find their feet after um, 1534. Um, and, and then we've got um, the great victory that we beholden to the um, Inca in 1537, but that's to come. Some of you are getting confused uh, with some of the stuff I'm saying at this point. I'm trying to give you an unbiased view with some other historians' views as well. Now, I'm thinking, Keith, mm. if, if, some, if a historian said that the Incan army f in the field was 100,000, would you believe it? No. No. <laughs> no. It's like, it's like most armies, they're always exaggerated, aren't they? This is completely exaggerated. They, they, to be honest with you, when you look at the, those, those I, I, I calculated this. I thought, right, what we're going to do, uh, these, these roads all the way around the empire, thousands of miles of roads from north to south, 2,000 miles, and then you've got all the other roads going off along the Andes and so on. The, these roadways are the width of the public footpath, um, 
um, outside the GP practice <coughs> in Lanswick Major. You know, that, that sort of width, not, not massively wide, but a little bit wider. How are you going to get 100,000 soldiers down that route way? Mm, maybe, yeah. two, maybe two abreast? How, how long would the supply chain and the soldiers be? Hundreds of miles in length. That is not practical. Mm. And by the time you get them into the... All the Spanish need to do is just sit at the side of the road and just push them over. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not practical. No. I mean, at the height of the Roman Empire, the maximum army they could put out would be about 30,000. Yes, because the rest of the um, um, soldiers were spread all the way around the empire. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that thing. I, I, I doubt what I'm reading. And when you doubt what you're reading, you've got to question it. Um, so when, when, we, when we look at those facts, um, and we look at fact number five, um, when I said at the beginning, um, at, at, the, at the height, I, I said something along the lines that, uh, this is Pizarro, I said something along the lines of the Incan Empire was conquered um, as a form of brutal conquest. They, they were forced into being within the empire, which is gonna cause resentment. It was not the Pax Romana um and it was a quick conquest a bit like the british empire and the roman empire then it goes stagnant with stagnation makes enemies of the people that you conquered um and is very much that some of these did support pizarro but then again they would have been armed with the same weapons that the main incan army would have been um, armed with so if you ask me how big i feel the incan army would have been i would probably see say the maximum they could probably feel is probably maybe a thousand, a thousand and a bit, which is still quite a, quite a lot, considering they had, would have had civil wars and all the rest of it. Um, I'm sure some of you can look up most of what I'm saying to you on Wikipedia and all the rest of it and find that I'm wrong, but I'm just going with the information in front of us. Um, now, the other point as well is number six. The Pizarro brothers ruled like a mafia. The unquestionable leader of the conquest of the Inca was Francisco Pizarro. If we are going to attribute the conquest of the Inca to him. An illegitimate, an illiterate Spaniard who at one time had herded the family's pigs. He's a pig farmer, a pig farmer, uneducated, but clever enough to swiftly identify the weaknesses of the Incan world disease being one of the great weaknesses. His, his, his brothers, um, Gonzalo, Hernando, and Juan, and you know, I can't make that up, can I? Um, you know, the, these, all these brothers um, would divvy up the Incan world. And from time to time, the Spanish would war amongst themselves, which is, which is quite interesting. They, they, they would fight amongst themselves. Um, so this isn't this isn't the um, this isn't the um, it, Inca fighting the Spanish. It's the Spanish fighting the Spanish. Uh, it's said by the year um, it's said by the year fifteen forty one. Pizarro had been killed by one of his own brothers in battle. So there you go. You got you got sort of get a subtext. And the Inca who are still holding on to their empire in the south are going. Hang on, we'll just let them play out, play, play themselves up against each other. So, um, so notes again. I'm going to read out what my notes tell me, and you already know I disagree with these. So, seven. The Inca had skilled generals. Tick, I do agree with that. Veteran soldiers, I do agree with that. Veteran soldiers have been involved in civil war. Massive armies um, in, the, in the tens of thousands, 100,000 soldiers. Uh-uh. The Spanish were greatly outnumbered. Well, I've got a feeling that they actually may not have been because it's very likely that the Inca were inept to field an army because of the civil wars. And how, is, how are the Inca going to feed this army after a civil war? Where are they going to get the grain from? All these questions. Um, we've mentioned ab about all the attributes the Spanish had, but the greatest attribute was their diseases. Um, there were no horses in South America, and actually, after a while, the Inca would have got used to the fact um, of these Spanish um, disciplined cavalry charges. And by the way, 
how long would it take for for 60 um was it 62 horses um all you need is one or two horses dying along the route to Cuzco, and then this big cavalry group um is going to be much reduced it's not going to take long there's there's lots of problems in in this text there's so many problems in what i'm reading it says, for example, the Spanish armor and the helmets made of steel made their wearers practically invulnerable and fine steel swords could cut through any armor the natives could put together. Well, I'm, I'm sure um, one of the natives in, in a tree um, with his aim right would be able to um, hit um, one of these Spaniards and at a point that this would have gone through one of the joints in the Spaniard's armor armor and the spaniard wasn't completely covered in in armor the the armor actually covered the chest maybe down to the knees it, but his arms were exposed because if his arms are not exposed he's not able to wield a sword you know all these wonderful things you can't wear that type of armor on a horse it just doesn't work oh and by the way this this is um this is going to be in temperatures that the spaniards would not have been used to tropical diseases tropical rainforests where are the facts in any of this information? I was absolutely livid when I was reading this. I thought this lecture was going to be so easy that I could actually agree with it all. I'm, 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 I've got a bit tamping now, haven't I? <laughs> Only as usual. Right, fact number eight. And we're going, to, we're going to leave this fact here after we've done this. So you go, fact number eight. The conquest of the Inca was essentially a long-term armed robbery. I agree on the part of the conquistadors. Like many thieves, they soon began to squabble, as we've already mentioned. By 1542, um, they were screwing with the King of Spain. In other words, these people were, were more richer than the King of Spain. And the King of Spain was saying, hang on a minute. I've sent these clans over there to conquer the Incan world, and now they're more powerful than me. Anyway, we're going we're gonna to leave the um, El Dorado thing, um, but what we're going to do um, is I want, um, I want to look at um, um, Coracancha, okay? Coracancha is as it, is as it said, Coracancha. Um, Coracancha itself, and this is one of the remains of one of the temples at Coracancha. Now, I was, um, I came familiar with this um, not so many years ago. And I thought, is that real? Could that actually be real? Is, is this, and these, these buildings are, are, the, are the buildings that, that we see associated with the Incan world. This is Coracancha. This is, this is the religious complex um, at Cusco. Uh, this is the Temple of the Sun, the Temple of um, Inti. Um, and the one temple the Temple of the Sun um, at Coracancha uh, is not only believed to be the most holy site in the Incan world, well, from our translation it is, but um, this is considered um, by Westerners and maybe the Inca themselves to be the centre of the Incan world, the centre of the world. The site was also known as the Golden Enclosure and was dedicated to the highest gods in the Inca uh, pantheon such as the creator god, Vira Kocha, and the moon goddess, um, um, Aquilia, and especially to Inti, the god of the sun. Little remains today except some sections of its fine stone walls, which hint at the site's once massive size and the legendary stories which tell of the enormous quantity of gold used to decorate the temples and its golden garden. So what I'd like to do, I would like to look at Coracancha after the break, but I'd like to mention this first. Inside the temple. Um, and we've gone a bit too far a minute. El Dorado Petiti. Uh, the, the, the architecture of the Incan world up until about um, 1500. The construction of the complex is completely attributed uh, to the very great leaders of the Incan world into the 1450s, who embarked on a general rebuilding program at Cusco and Coracancha. Despite excavations, though, the exact chronology of the site is unclear because 
when you're building like this over a, a long period of time, Keith, it's very difficult to work out the difference between an early stage of building and a later stage of building. But it might be because the earlier stage of building is building in larger blocks and the later stage of building, you've got very well dressed ashlar type blocks, but a bit smaller. And then, then after 1500, it's just all random. So there's basically the, the, the three stages. Um, and when we, when we look at these, we, we think about um, the one thing that you can say about the, the landscape of understanding of, of these buildings um, is that they are all seemingly dedicated to um, Inti. Um, the gold is dedicated to Inti. This, what, what, what this description has is that the main temple of the sun at Korakancha is a main temple in the middle with sort of um, other sites going out from it, various different roads, as if it's the headdress of Inti um, itself. And, you know, as, as, the, as these sort of roadways go out to other golden temples, that's the hair of Inti, um, the, the golden hair of Inti. And I've, I've got an image to show you, which I don't have with these slides. That I'll actually get ready um, bef before we start back. Um, so this, these, these, these lines leading to these roads leading to these other temples from Korakancha, 328 sacred sites um, from 41 roadways, these golden roadways, probably gold all the way along the length. And I'm not exaggerating. That's where the gold is coming from, <coughs> Korakancha. All the gold was taken to Korakancha. And this is what this old thing was about. There was, it was everywhere, literally. And actually, you would be going along and you'd be picking gold off the floor. This is what we're talking about. Kuzkil, Kuzco uh, it's, itself was deliberately laid out to represent a jaguar um, as Korakancha, the temple site, was as we described. The, unfortunately, Korakancha and um, Cusco are one now because of the sprawling city, but um, that's something else. So these two distinctively se separate sites. And can I actually mention something that I actually remember from ages ago? We did a class some time ago, and I mentioned that... Um, the irrigation systems and the um, water canals leading to um, Cusco um, have been reinstated by the local water company. Um, and they are the original Incan water systems leading into Cusco. So that's a really interesting, really interesting fact there. And they've actually reinstated them. That's how good they were, well built. Yeah. In typical Incan uh, symmetry, the second most important sacred site in the city uh, was located um, again near Coracancha. Um, Korakancha was also built um, where the city's two great rivers um, met. And what we're going to do, we're going to talk about this after the break. I'm going to find that other um, article, which um, I, I haven't got. And we've got um, a, lots to go through still, including this great victory at um, Oyatayatambo um, in, in January the year 1537. So we'll go on to that. Um, what I would like to do is ask, uh, are there any questions from you, Keith, before we put the camera on? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to say, did the Incas build temple uh, pyramids in the same way as the Central American uh, empires did, like the Aztecs and the Toltecs? And when, you're talk, like when you're talking about the stepping, this is, this is stepping associated with um, the mountain sides. M more more structurally involved with the mountain size than individual standing structures in that way um the the type of building is different um and is less ornate compared with the ones with the Az aztec kingdom um but the reason why they're less ornate is because the gold cladded the outsides of the temple making them ornate so there's a difference in interpretation there right Any, anything else keith no, I only have a point. You mentioned that the population size of the empire at its maximum was about 12 million. 12 million, yes. By, by, yeah, sorry. Um, you split this out and I'll tell you what it was by yeah, um, 1572. Because if you consider that half of that is roughly men, so you got 6 million. So 4 million between 20 and 40. So theoretically, you could have a very large size of army taken from that number of men, but you know, whether that would work out in that way, because you had to have armies keeping down any possible revolts elsewhere and things like that. So, you know, it's difficult to work out what the size of an army would be, really. But that's, that's 12 million at its, at its height in about its 15, peak, yeah. 1528. By 1532, we don't know what disease did, 
by 1572, yeah. wait for the figure, 90% of the population in the Incan world was dead or gone or enslaved. And how do we know that? It's quite an easy mathematical equation. 90% um, of all the Incan settlements, towns and villages are deserted by 1572. Calculate, calculating that calculates the numbers to 12 million. 90% um, of them are abandoned. That means 90% of the population is dead through disease or enslaved, which is quite phenomenal. If you want to compare that with the diaspora associated with North Africa to um, North America, you can work out the same loss of people enslaved. So, um, you know, th this, is, this is where we can go with that. So what we're going to do, oh God, I hope people are going to be easy on me now. So here we go, Keith. <laughs> Let's let's get the vent of everybody because I want to break everybody. Um, I'm going to say, can I? Um, can we keep um, questions to um, just one for everybody? And welcome for joining us, Jane, as well. Glorious, wonderful, Jane. By the way, Jane, today we've got um, annoying Kathy with us and delectable Terry. So what I'm going to do, and we've got Eleanor who's joined us from Wednesday evening as well. So we're going to unmute all of you. Keep it just to one statement or question, please, everybody. Um, I've unmuted you all. So, Goff, at the head of this, what would you like to say? Unmuted, thanks. Can't hear you, Goff. Yeah. It wouldn't be surprising. I have now. I've unmuted this. <laughs> I'm going to mute you in a minute, Eleanor, be, uh, Karen, because of the noise. I'll unmute you in a minute. Right, Goff, can you, can you uh, say your bit? Can't hear him. Okay, right. Rosamond, anything? Um, well, I was just thinking about the Warring Brothers, which was similar to the Cymru Brothers that we were talking about last night. It seems to be a theme. <laughs> uh, yes, actually, the, the best way of looking at it, the downfall of any civilization is usually at the hands of the people who've built it. And, okay. I, and I think, um, you know, I, I, the analogy, the Roman Empire, that was always destroyed internally. Uh, again, I'm going to use this as a, as a weird distortion. Europe was destroyed by Europeans. The technology was destroyed by Europeans in the First World War. We did that. We can't, we can't blame aliens or anything. We destroyed society. Um, um, right, Jane, anything to say? Quick. No. Uh, Pam? No. Um, Jim? I haven't, I haven't muted Jim. Right, okay then. Um, Eleanor, did you like to say anything? No? Okay. What about um, Sue? Uh, your end, Sue. Anything you would like to say? And Terry, anything? Sue? Um, I, I, was, I was muted when you asked me. Go on, Eleanor. Uh, <coughs> I was just saying, um, the Incas hadn't seen horses, I don't think, do they, before the, the um, Spaniards they, came through? They hadn't seen them, but they didn't need them because um, you can't get horses along those trails. That, no, they, 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 and a lot, of, a lot of the Spaniards uh, trying to cover, uh, come over the Andes uh, lost their lives, didn't they, because of the... Ah, uh, yes, uh, looking, uh, looking for Petiti. This is all these points, disease and all the rest of it, and you're thinking, it's almost as if historians paint this army of Pizarro as being indestructible. You know, they, the, the, first, the first sort of little battle at um, Cayamarca, no Spaniards died. You know, you don't see this in history. One or two Spaniards dead, maybe one horse dead. You know, there you go. And then you go a little bit further along the trail. Um, one Spaniard comes off his horse and goes down the gully. And then they, there's guerrilla tactics and all the rest of it. And you start to see that there's something wrong about what the historians are telling us. Um, right. I was, interest, I was interested in the... Um, um, in Cusco, it's, uh, all the buildings there, the foundations to the buildings are still the original uh, Inca yes. constructions that, that, because I, they, I, they I, couldn't improve on those, I think. You know? And there was one in one, one lane, I'm try, I can't find it now on my uh, uh, iPhone, um, uh, where one of the stones, because they're so perfectly constructed yes. and slotted in, it's got 12 different sides at uh, different angles to the stone and it's you know it's quite amazing that you're talking about if i can find the photograph hmm? 
I'll, I'll be able to find that because that's you're talking about Kaya Maka, and we'll, I've got an image of that we'll be looking at, and not the precise one you're talking about. But you're I've right. Got, you I've got a fake picture of it here somewhere. Mm -hmm. You can't get a credit card in between. So what I'm going to say, um, also Sue and Terry, you haven't got your mic in on. So Karen, I'm going to put you can put your mic on now. So talk, Kathy and Ka Kathy and Karen, go for it. Right. Uh, just in terms of you talking about the size of the army. I think the sheer terrain would make it very difficult for a large Inca army because you've got the, it's basically divided into three strips. You've got the coastal strip, which is quite narrow. Then you're up in the Andes, very, you know, incredibly high mountain peaks. And then you've got the Amazon, the last strip, you know, so jungle. So, you know, you could not have a army of 100,000 people fighting. I just wouldn't be physically able to do that. And can I take that point a minute? The, the reason why the Inca are farming on hills is because there's very few little flat land. And how are you supposed mm, to... Yeah, that's why they've terraced them all. Yeah. Exactly. Um, there's, uh, that's a wonderful point. And uh, if you've got your photographs, you've got to show them um, in a moment. Anything you'd like to say, Kathy? No. Kathy's <laughs> been quiet. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> uh, um, Jim, Jim hasn't got anything to say, and, I, and Sue hasn't put her I, mic on. Yeah. Jim has, Jim uh, has. Not all time. Good on. Right, go, go on, go on. Uh, say something, Jim, because I'm going to bring Sue in, and then, then Karen's going to come back with her images. Anything you want to say, Sue and um, Terry? Oh, no. We're good. Hey, Terry, it's good to see you. Hey, come on, let's have a look at your face. I want to see you. <laughs> come, come a bit forward, and then you can see. It's good to be here. You look like, oh, one, of those, you look like one of those weird explorers. You look like Harold Bingham, the archaeologist from 1911, mm. um, who we're going to look at in an image. Well, good to see you, Terry. And what we're going to do, Karen, I want you to show the, us the images before, um, before we have a quick cup of tea. What okay. Right. I've, I've selected a few. So this is uh, Inca mummies from the Chet. Chile Cemetery near Nazca. Nice. So you can see that they buried them with their like knees folded up to under their chin. And you can see because of the very arid conditions there that they've still got hair, the materials there, the ropes they bound them with. It's all perfectly preserved. Mm. Next. And then that's another image there showing they actually dug pits down and sort of lined them with adobe bricks. Right, then this is Saxe Huaman, which is um, an Inca fortress above Cusco. So I don't know if you can see there, it's like on three layers. Yes. Three layers, because they believed in three layers. You had the domain of the gods, the domain of men, and then the domain of the dead. And this is a close-up to give you an idea of scale. That's me <laughs> standing next to one of the rocks. So you can see how huge that rock is. Yeah? So it makes uh, Stonehenge yeah, yeah, look yeah, like a bunch of kids have built it. Uh, this is the Corrie Cancha, which as you could see from the photo Carl did, is actually inside the church now. They built a Catholic church over it, but preserved what was left of it. Uh, then this is what Ellen was talking about. This is a street in Cusco, so you can see the bottom is the Inca, the original Inca foundations, and they've just slapped their houses on top of them. Uh, that's um, Inca ruins at Oye Tantambo. Is that better there? Yes, you get an idea of the scale, just massive at the end of the Sacred Valley there. Then I've got two photos of burial towers here at Silustani, which is near Puno, so near Lake Titicaca. And they used to bury their, like, their rich, you know, the rich and the noble were buried in these towers, so circular towers. So you can see one there, and again, you can see the sort of amazing stonework there. And then there's another one there. 
be quite interesting. Well, let's have one more. Go on. Uh, right. Okay. So that is Temple of the Sun at Machu Picchu. Oh. I think you've got something on your dress. Be get gentle. Be gentle. Is it oh, yeah. set? Yeah. Be I, so what I'm going to do is I don't, somebody's talking about something on their dress. So thank you for that, Karen. They were really good. I enjoyed them. Thank you. Yes. Right. So so what we're get, what we're going to do you? now? We're going to um, we're going to um, go back to uh, all of us, and I'm just going to take a break. So uh, I, it's needed. Yeah, need a coffee. Okay. How long, Carl? 10 minutes? 15? Um, <coughs> no more than 10. Okay, thanks. I'm going to take a break too. See you all okay. later. Let's see you. Okay, I have a coffee. coffee. Yeah. Just coffee. Right, so um, there we go. I'm going to put you all in the um, corner up there. We are now recording. Um, Kat, you know, it's great to have Kathy muted because before the break, Kathy said to me, well, what if all the Spaniards were in ranks firing um, into the Incan lines? And I basically realized afterwards that the technique of firing in rows and the technique of firing in, in, in sort of a groups, you've got one row firing, then another row, that wasn't developed an, until a few years later. Um, so the sense of firing in rows is, is not something that was done. Basically, at that time, everyone would have fired off their um, hand cannons and then they would have reloaded. Um, the, uh, you know, talking about the likes of Rock, Rock's Drift, you know, first rank fire, second rank fire, third rank fire, that wasn't devised until later on. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're back to where we were when we were looking at the um, association with the fighting between the um, Inca and the Spanish. Now, one thing I wanted to show you, I've got, I've got this article printed out in front of me, um, and it's actually from here, actually. And where we left it was um, the area about the building skills. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna go down, this is basically an Inca golden sun mask, and you can clearly see this, Jane, yeah? Yeah, it's lovely. Now, this is what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, is Coracancha in the middle there, um, and then what you would have, you'd have about 41 uh, of these little pathways going off from the center of Coracancha, leading to 328 sacred sites. And the, this is all associated with the gold um, sense of, um, of Inti and the Temple of the Sun. So the Temple of the Sun, Coracancha being in the middle. So one, one point that was made, and, and Karen really illustrated that earlier on, but Karen didn't have this image. This is actually the where Karen probably says, I've actually got it here. So uh, this is actually um, the original wall of that central Temple of the Sun precinct in Coracancha, now within um, the landscape of Cuzco, obviously two separate sites back then. Um, and look at the stonework. This is, this is that in, emboldened stonework associated with the Incan craftsmen going back to 1450. Um, remember when we look at later Incan work, it's very different and earlier Incan work is very different again. Um, so the Inca bu built using the fine masonry skills for which the Inca have rightly become famous. And obviously in those early stages, so right, um, with uh, blocks finely cut and um, fitting perfectly together without the use of mortar. Now this is more of the regular course work rather than the irregular um, course work that Karen showed you on in images, which we'll be looking at as well later. The large curved western wall was particularly noted for its form and elegance. Regular masonry, most walls also leaned slightly inwards as they rose in height. And you can slowly see that. And that's with most buildings, most sort of, most people are building in this way, large sort of structures. You can even see this with the blocks in, in sort of Orkney and Shetland, where they sort of start to taper inwards. Um, it said as well, if we, if we want to actually go back to my images, so we need to stop the screen share in a minute. Let's go on to my images and here we go, back to this again. You'll, uh, it'll be look a bit confusing at this minute, right? So here we go, Jane, what you should, what I'm going to do, Jane, is put you back on um, and we're going to share the screen. 
and delayed a bit. Okay, sharing the screen. Um, and we are back to here. Thank you. When you see the oh, image, we can, you see, oh, yeah. You got the image now, Jane? Yes? It's coming. It's coming. It's doing its thing. Yeah, got it. That's what the actress said to the bishop, but that's very rude. Anyway, <laughs> ma many of these doorways, um, if you can think, looking inside this building, the whole idea as, as the light shone into these buildings, they would illuminate against the gold which cladded these walls. Now, each, each of the um, plates of gold uh, were about two pounds in weight. It said that the, the temple precinct of the Temple of the Sun had over 700 half meter square sheets of gold each way in two kilograms each. So this isn't just, this isn't a little bit of gold. This, this is gold everywhere on the inside of the walls and the outside of the walls of these buildings. There were a number of these buildings within the Temple of the Sun precinct. Um, so when we, when we think about this, um, when you would see inside these buildings, it's almost as if the walls would glow white. You know, the effect of the sun, it looks yellow, but it gives whiteness, it gives light. Um, and this is embodied within these buildings and with, uh, within these walls and within the faces and all the rest of it, they are studded with various precious stones, including emeralds. The Temple of the Sun, this main temple area that we're talking about, this is one of a number of buildings around the central precinct. And this is where the, the Cathedral of Cuzco is now built directly on top of this pagan site, which is quite ironic. Um, gold, it said, is set to represent the sweat of the sun, <laughs> the sweat of the god himself, um, Inti, um, beaten into sheet plates. As I've said, these 700 half meter square sheets weighed two kilograms each and if you want to work out the math on that that's 1400 kilograms in weight with the golden sheets alone inside the temple besides the golden artifacts relevant to the god's worship was a golden statue of inti encrusted with jewels probably a number of smaller statues associated with inti it's said that this larger statue of inti was, was once the place that the um, Inca uh, leaders cremated remains were placed within, obviously, after the statue was captured um, by the conquistadors, they would have melted it down, getting rid of the ashes. Um, every day, it said, from what the priests could write down, the Catholic priests, from the priests associated with this pagan site it said that the, the the figure would be brought out every single day erected into the central courtyard the sun would radiate off the face of inti glowing as if it was the sun in the sky itself inti was the embodiment of the statue down below on the earth the garden of the temple was a wonderfully conceived homage to inti um, and the garden, the central precinct, the courtyard. Um, just imagine, close your eyes, everybody. So you've got a um, sort of square rectangular courtyard with buildings arranged around the outside. And these look into the courtyard. Um, and the courtyard itself was described, the garden described as follows. It was a garden of gold. Just as land, sometimes entire regions were dedicated to the god Inti associated with the Incan uh, pantheon and the landscape. This central garden, this courtyard, was constructed in honor of the great sun god Inti himself. Everything in it was made of gold and silver. A large field of corn and life-side models of shepherds, llamas, jaguars, guinea pigs, monkeys, various birds, butterflies, and a number of insects were crafted in precious gold or silver and stones. And if that wasn't enough to please Inti, there were also a large number of gold and silver jars, all encrusted with precious stones. All that survives of these wonders are a few golden corn stalks, 
But when you think about this, those golden corn stalks are, are, are just a tiny fragment, a whiff in the air of what once existed. I could go on and look at the reason, the rest of these notes, but I will not simply because we've got a lot to go through. But what we will look at is this, how the, how this temple complex was treated. Carl, Carl, when was that built? This was built in around 1450. Okay. The conquistadors would have got here in 1433. And do you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm glad you've interrupted there because it's just reminded me of something. Um, it says, close my eyes, go into this. Basically, um, when Pizarro entered the city of Cusco, uh, after a conflict, the local priests welcomed Pizarro. And as Pizarro looked down at his feet in Cusco, and going over to the Temple of Sun Precinct at Coracancha, looking at those great proud walls cladded in gold. It said he was invited into the temple precinct area with his men. Pushing the priest aside, his men started to rip, rip the gold plates off the temple wall. And then they forced the golden door open, which was a wooden door cladded in gold they forced the golden door open and they ripped out the statue of inti um emptying the ashes um and ripping out the jewels and and stones from the precinct wall and within these temples and it's said that with them writing all this down and recording this was a catholic priest and the catholic priest was saddened to see the Inca priests on their knees, sobbing their, their eyes out, so, sobbing their hearts out. Uh, the priest felt so sorry for them. And the later history was that the Christian mm. monastery of Santa Domingo was built on top of the complex, no doubt in a deliberate attempt to signify that one religion had replaced, was replaced by another. Most of the gold from the site was, of course, melted in ingots, and taken for the Spanish crown. Well, we know that's not exactly true. Uh, the star piece, the golden statue of Inti, was taken to a place of safety. Um, and, and eventually um, it disappeared without trace, probably melted down like so many other Incan artifacts. I've heard another story as well that um, the statue of Inti that day um was actually melted down and made into the cross of santa domingo so i've got something conflicting with my notes here which is, which is not a bad thing can't agree with everything so um so anyway what we need to do is, is go on a little bit further because there's lots to actually go on to still um and that actually got a bit sad then didn't it so um what we're going to do is um we need to look at the the el dorado myth there's one other point here that the ten, point number 10, where I said it was nine points we were doing. Point 10 says how wonderful the Spanish were and they went on to doing great things, which I'm not going to read. Um, sorry to be so biased. Um, so anyway, moving on from this, what we need to do now is look for El Dorado. <coughs> now, um, the myth associated with El Dorado is that El Dorado is somewhere, uh, if I can get my, um, so this is sort of just south, this, this sort of lake um, is just south of um, um, Cusco um, and it, beyond the Andy range. And it's said that anywhere um, associated with this lake um, is actually, hang on a minute, let me get, is associated with this lake is the lost city of El Dorado, somewhere, anywhere. Uh, it could be anywhere, it could be down the Amazon uh, River somewhere, it could be down this range, it could be all the way down, uh, leading into Chile. So here we go, with, with all those very wealthy individuals on the expedition, um, they now had treasure, land, slaves and molasses. Sorry about the molasses. So um, they were very rich. So what happened really was that when they were coming back, 
This inspired thousands of Europeans, poor Europeans, to move to South America and try their luck. Before long, desperate ruthless men were arriving in the small towns and ports of the New World. A rumour began to grow of a mountain kingdom beyond the range of the Andes, richer than ever the Inca had been. Somewhere in North South America, thousands of men set out in dozens of expeditions. Most of these expeditions failed and most of the men and women never ever returned. But it was, it was only an illusion and some say never existed, except <laughs> the fevered imagination of the gold-hungry man who so desperately wanted to believe it. Gold is always the way of man. California, the way of man. This is the um, Solomon's Mines as well. It's always that search for gold. However, um, strangely enough, and if anyone's ever heard of the city of Z, um, the expedition of a certain um, a, a explorer known as Fawcett, um, and Brad Pitt, Pitt uh, plays the character Fawcett in the film, um, Lost City of Z. If any of you have seen that film, that's actually based on a true story. Fawcett, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, is said to have gone searching for the city of Z, and is said to have found it. Uh, except he never ever returned from his final expedition with his son, and um, which is quite a tragedy. But you know, one thing I'm going to say, and I don't want to talk too much about El Dorado. Let's just try and let's try and get to the end part of the lecture. The the one thing I would say is that in 2001, there was a researcher who um, went to the Vatican City archives, and a priest in the 1600s describes a petiti. Um, the city of gold, El Dorado, um, and he described it that there was a city of gold. Um, and strangely enough, from from the 1990s until finding this document, and after finding this document, 2001, many expeditions have gone out to find the city of gold. Many expeditions have never ever returned, but it is believed by some more recent lidar evidence that the city of gold has been located. However, we will actually towards the end go to Vilcabamba, which I do believe Karen has actually been to. Vilcabamba uh, um, is also believed to be the place um, of the city of gold, El Dorado. It was one of the last sites to be classed as the capital of the Inca. So what I'd like to do now is actually move on. We've got a bit of Machu Picchu first, and then we go to Vilcabamba and we call it, we, we go it to an end. So there we go, there's Pizarro. Um, there's his followers around him. Uh, there's his wonderful sword. And he's saying, look what the land that I've actually come to. He's completely plated in armor, but the bog standard um, infantry soldier wouldn't have been. Remember, armor was quite expensive. That there is Machu Picchu, the place I never ever went to and the place that I'll never ever get to see. Um, and that is one of the uh, regrets um, of my life. Um, so I couldn't, can't really tell you from first hand what we're about to discuss. But what we're about to discuss, I, I, I thought and examined over the years many, many times. So what we're gonna talk about is um, Machu Picchu. And we're gonna talk about Machu Picchu as a site that was probably constructed sometime just before the 1500s, maybe a, a long time earlier, there is earlier evidence. Um, and it was believed to be a place that um, the archeologist Haram uh, Bingham um, is said to have discovered in 1911. But it's also argued that it was never discovered by Haram Bingham. It had always been known about by the local people. It's this, just that they didn't tell any Westerners. Haram Bingham, in other words, is the first Westerner to discover this site. Um, actually, when Haram Bingham um, visited this site for the first time in 1911, there were four families living at this site which Haram Bingham soon turfed off the site so that when anyone else come on the site, he could say, look at what I've discovered. Nobody's lived here since the 1600s, uh, which, is, which is a great shame, really. Um, 
there are some information there's some information that we're going to look at now now one in one interesting question i've got and this is not a question this is this is a um it's more of a statement than a question why is it that we've got a really high technology and these people are thatching their roofs why aren't they um roofing their spaces in a more technological way the answer is i don't know however this is um the site of Machu Picchu in its later days, probably after um, the 1340s, when it's now part of the isolated state um, associated with Vilcabamba. Um, and this Inca state survived until 1572. So the Spanish didn't wipe out the Inca um, and the last power of the Inca until at least 1272. It said that the Inca actually continued on until 1620. And whoever said um, before the break about the, um, you know, people, you know, anyone going beyond the um, Andean range disappears in thick jungle um, to end up with tropical diseases or at the spears of local tribes people has got a very good point. And it's probably that this, this last vestiges of the Incan civilization lasted because they were isolated and because they were able to defend themselves now one thing that one thing that we've mentioned a couple of things back and forth is this is this is um sort of a panoramic plan um in a way um of uh, machu picchu um a couple of points um the person who asked about did did they have temples like the aztecs well if you want to class this as like step <coughs> type landscape which is natural then the answer is yes but it, in lots of ways the answer is no because it's all this is all natural um but what they do the the inca very much um utilize their landscape to its fullest so obviously you've got the terracing on the left and this is rather interesting um and this is a question that karen can actually answer did karen go all the way up the step well all the way up from the bottom of the valley um, all the way up to um, the gateway uh, leading into the precinct uh, associated with Machu Picchu. Some believe the following. Some believe this was the last um, holdout of the, uh, of the um, Incan leaders. Others believe it's um, Vilcabamba, which I'm going to go on to. Others believe that this was a retreat for the um, Incan royal family. Others believe that this was the end of the valley um where this was part of a holy um landscape but there's one thing that i can clearly tell you and this is a rather interesting question if this was one of the places of the last holdouts of the incas not the only one but one of the last places why is it harold bingham that archaeologists have found very little gold at this site gold to the inca was not an important um item it was important associated with the god but they didn't value it in the same that we value it today um machu picchu they found very little gold um and the thing is the spanish never ever got here so why is that there's some strange questions there's some eerie questions and that leads me back to the beginning jane because i said that the um incan civilization was already in the throes of collapse um lots of the buildings at machu picchu were poorly built it's almost as if these are the, the, the sites are rebuilt by Incans that were on the last edges of their civilization well before the Spanish. Um, and gold not being important, it wouldn't be there anyway. So all these in, individual little points um, tell us that there's other things going on than just the Spanish associated uh, with the collapse of the Incan civilization. Um, moving on again again a little plan lots of people make these plans um and when it says it's a it's a city gate right it's a city gate that to only two people abreast can uh, can walk through it's quite a low lintel um and you can sort of think about the up, upper complex being maybe the aristocracy not really not sure i can't really call that you've got all these serviceable buildings What's really going on, we really don't understand. And a little bit of a secret temple over here. So we're going to look at some of the masonry. I didn't really want to do a lecture about Machu Picchu. I just want to do, do a bit of an overview to try it in with 
um, the collapse of the civilization of the Inca. This is that little gateway, very, very small gateway. Now this, this, this gateway is, is rather interesting because this is probably a little bit earlier than um, lots of the other buildings at Machu Picchu. This is probably built in the early stages. You know, all that locked stone, it's, it, it looks rather higgledy-piggledy, but not as higgledy-piggledy as the random stonework associated with the rest of Machu Picchu. Pro this probably dates from just around the um, 1500s rather than the later stages of build. Um, and the theory that, I, that theory that I'm developing now is very much associated with an archaeologist who studied these sites for a very, very long time. Um, if you if you look at this uh, reconstruction drawing, you can see the massive stones, um, and then you actually start to see that the rest of the stonework is actually of poor quality. But if you look at um, typical um, um, structures to do with the Incan civilization, it's it's mega build. All the stones are big, massive build. No small stones, and that leads me into the very point that when civilizations are collapsing there's less and less people around meaning less and less people for armies meaning less and less people for building meaning less and less people for maintenance roads meaning less and less people after a civil war meaning more and more to the collapse of the civilization before um, the spanish ever ever get there and obviously disease is a very important factor in all this as well the condors there beautiful birds Flight of the condors. Oh, and that beautiful bird singing there. Jane, keep your window open, it's great. So anyway, <laughs> I, 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 can, I can hear all the birds singing, it's absolutely wonderful. Oh, that's nice. It, 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 is, it is nice. Um, well, whilst, whilst we're waiting for my slide to come up, um, listen to this. And one of the largest factors was the diseases that the Spanish brought from Europe. As we've said, typhus, influenza, smallpox, diphtheria, measles, absolutely devastated the Incan population. The massive and efficient road system of the Inca um, got these diseases around quickly. By the time of the completion of the Spanish conquest, some say in 1272, um, possibly or more than 90% of the Incan population were gone. The rest would remain a bit longer in which the last of the Incan empire was gone by 1620. So I do believe we've got a problem with our images at this minute. So what I'm going to do, I, I'm going to see what's happened. Um, and Jane, tell us what you think with what we've been looking at so far. Sorry, tell me, tell me what, what I think about what? What we've been looking at so far, oh, whilst, yeah. whilst I'm trying to get these images up. Well, it's all just amazing, isn't it? You know, all that um, gold and what have you in the temple is just beautiful, really beautiful. But was that, um, was Machu Picchu um, an ordinary community? Just, a, you know, an example of an ordinary um, Inca community. Or was it a special, a particularly special place? Now that that is a very very interesting question, and I I would yeah that is a very very interesting question. And are you seeing the images up on the screen now? Yes. Right. Good. You can see a roadway. Yeah. That is a very very interesting question. And why is that a very interesting question? Because nobody's answered it, right? And because it was because it was isolated and found by. Um, a really professional archaeologist who knew, knows it all in 1911, Harold Bingham, he immediately said, this is, this is the last vestige of the Incan civilization. Look at this. Look how amazing this is. But Jane, if you compare it with these walls, it's not, is it? Mm. It's, no. not, it's not like this. It's, it's very different. You know, it's, it's almost as if it's an afterthought and maybe it was last of the holdouts um, associated with the Incan world, which would be very, very sensible, Jane. Um, and, you know, I've, I've seen TV 
series is by the National Geographic and that like, and they say, oh, you know, the last Incan leaders were here. The last true emperors of the Incan world were here in the 1540s and the 1550s. And you're thinking, why would they have gone there? Because it's isolated. Um, it's, it's, it's nowhere. And you're thinking, this doesn't look like the high Incan civilization that they were used to. If you can compare that um, with, with the sites that we've already seen, um, Coracancha, for example, Machu Picchu is nothing like it, and nor is this masonry. This is our early masonry, um, and that isn't Karen, but that's somebody also posing like Karen would. Um, moving on again, these roadways, back to everything we've seen at the beginning, uh, and we've mentioned, this roadway isn't long, isn't very wide. It's very long. These roadways can be a thousand miles in length. You're not going to get an army along here. And that leads me to think, if you've got, um, if you've got the conquistadors leading towards Cusco, even from a port along the sea, if they managed to reach there, they would still have a distance to get to Cusco. These, these routeways would be perilous. And you're starting to think that maybe there was no resistance. Um, maybe they were seeing uh, the bereft and destroyed Incan civilization. That's how they were able to get to Cusco quite rapidly. You know, those birds sound great. <laughs> now, now, Jane, are you seeing the point I'm making? This is actually at uh, Machu Picchu. Yeah, yeah, definitely doesn't look that grand, does it? The, the stuff at the bottom looks grand, but the stuff at the top yeah. looks... Ex that is my point. That, that is key to the whole lecture. This, I, uh, there, there was an archaeologist, he, he did a lot of work on this. And what he's saying is basically what I've taken on board. He said, look, the Incan civilization after the um, Civil War had collapsed. There were very few people around and not the stain stonemasons that there had been before. When they're trying to rebuild their towns and cities, they're having to do it in the poor way, not in the way that they had before. And this is what we've seen at Machu Picchu. You're looking at earlier walls that look really fine. And that is the stuff that's used to the vulcanized activity, um, the seismic tremors. And then later on, the buildings are not built in the same way. Not to ram home the point, but the point I'm, I'm trying to make uh, bears out um, the end of the Inca. You know, when you look at something like this, right, this is, this is a later Inca building. It looks okay, but it's not really built for uh, the seismic activity, but that is. Can you see, you can clearly see the difference, Jay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, that, that, is, that is impressive. You know, yeah. if, I was an, if I was an Incan leader, right, uh, I would prefer to be living in a building like this rather than the one you've already yeah. seen. And then look around it, look at the uh, poor masonry around it. It's, it's almost as if this is an afterthought. Um, anyway, trying to move on again, my next slide. Um, and this is, this is probably dating from about the 1500s uh, also at, um, also at the likes of Machu Picchu. Um, even though, even though it's a bit r random looking, it's, it's a lot better than the image that we've seen bef um, Hang on, here we go. If we can just quickly go back. That there is fine Aztec um, architecture. And comparing it again with that is no comparison. Yeah. So this is, yeah. this, is, this is about from about the age of, um, uh, 15, 1532 and we've got a bit a bit of a delay with the slide so um, I'm gonna have a slurp whilst we're waiting it did it by itself then right come on da, da, da. right there we go and uh, move on right next and uh, next this is itself is probably about 1500. So they, they, the, the skills are starting to drop, but they're still able to create nice little buildings like this, but not like the one from 1532. Um, and again, 
this 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 type of stuff and um before karen shouting out this takes us to ayat tayatambo um now let's go a little bit back to my notes now it said that um by 1536, the, the north of the Incan world was under the hand of the Spanish, but the south was still under Incan control. Now, what happened is that a Spanish army, with supported by um, people who didn't like Inca, marched towards Ayatayatambo. Um, and it, this is where the Inca defeated... Um, a large enemy led by the Spanish. Casualties were quite high. It was an amazing Incan victory at the hands of their generals. It was great. Um, but the loss of life was too great. So they decided to abandon this site. Um, and look at that there. That is, that is amazing. The, the, the level of craftsmanship associated with that and you know whoever asked a question about you know where they're planting and all the rest of it they're, they're not only planting their crops on the side of the mountains they're living there the the level of of engineering there and the this is probably from about the 1500s as well where you've still got some of those skills to be able to build um, and this is why those buildings are still standing and this is Vilcabamba. Now, what can be said is at Vilcabamba, this is the place that the, the remains of the uh, um, Incan army actually retreated to um, after Ayatapambo, the Battle of Ayatapambo, because they, 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 they lost so many men that they just thought, well, we've, just, we've had a victory over the Spanish, but we've got to retreat. So they went back to Vilcabamba, and Vilcabamba itself, I think I've got a map. Hang on. Where's my little map? Hang on. That's uh, Harum Bingham. Hopefully I'll come across my map in a second. Come on. Map, 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 map. Um, this is where a frustration comes in, Jane. Hang on a minute. So... Just to just talk a little bit more about Vilcabamba before I actually show you the location. Um, and we've lost all the images again. So what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do folks, if, if we can I try to um, get that back up, hang on. And we move from there, hang on. Lost all the images a minute, hang on, sorry about this. Right, oh yes, got it back again, hang on. Right, so we're describing Vilcabamba again, and the one thing, this is my last image with Vilcabamba, actually. I'm going to try and get the, the map up, which, which I'm struggling to get at this minute. But the last uh, image with Vilcabamba, basically, this actually shows um, a spring at Vilcabamba. Um, and these are those three interesting things poking out there sort of drain into uh, a pool. Um, and you can actually see clearly that by the 1570s, um, this uh, the Incan civilization is is more or less completely collapsed with the way they're building, but they're still they're still used to their springs and they're they're still used to um, the sense of some of their old technology. Um, and to sort of show you where Vilcabamba is, so we sort of go um, a, a little um, bit sort of further south from um, Cusco and Vil there's Vilcabamba. Um, and as I say, it's part of the last Incan state. Um, and as we go back to the other image that we were uh, just quickly looking at, uh, associated with Vilcabamba. With Vilcabamba, can't get it up. Um, that is Vilcabamba um, from the Harold Bingham point of view. When he found Machu Picchu, he also found Vilcabamba and he basically said, you know, Vilcabamba is like a secondary town um, associated with Machu Picchu. Um, but it turns out from more recent excavations um, with Vilcabamba that we do believe that it's the last place uh, where the Incan civilization had a city. Um, and at that moment, um, whilst the images are, are really playing up for me, um, 
I'm going to ask you a question. This is um, the last image with Vilka Bamba, which we'll look at. Uh, again, Harold Bingham, um, find a Vilka Bamba. It now turns out definitely that this is the place that the Incan civilization is said to have had their last capital. All the archaeological evidence tells us that the Incan civilization survived until 1572. Um, and the death nail that we do see associated with the, an abandoned Vilcabamba is not of Spanish weapons. We don't find any signs that the, the, the Vilcabamba, the town itself, has been destroyed by the Spanish. We don't see that evidence. We don't see any uh, bullets or um, any sort of weapons um, from the S Spanish at the site, telling us that this site pro was abandoned due to another event. And that event must have been um, down to some of these horrible diseases brought to the Incan world by the Spanish, at which point the population, as we know, of the Incan world was so decimated, there was unlikely that anything left of the Incan civilization could continue then um, anymore. So what we're going to do, um, Jane, is we're going to ask, um, have you got any questions? This is Harold Bingham, the archaeologist. Um, at Vilcabamba. Have you got any questions, Jane? No, I think I did have some, but you've answered them all now. Good. Do you know what? It get really frustrating at the end then when my slides went all over the place. I do apologise for that, but I can't apologise for technology. But again, um, what I wanted to do was start off with all the other stuff, get in the middle with, um, uh, with Cusco. Um, to be honest with you, I do believe I've covered all the questions. What I'm going to do before we put all the mics on, everyone... Keep it very brief um, and keep it down to um, one or two sentences uh, and then we'll go from there because we've all got to have a say. So what I'm going to do, um, thank you for that, Jane. Keep me company and, and let's uh, bring everybody on the screen. It's going to take a few moments. Right, so um, let's have everybody unmuted. Okay, everybody's unmuted. So, Goff, anything you would like to say first? No, no, very interesting. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. I didn't think that would be all back today, to be honest with you, because it's... Uh, um... No, well, Eleanor's been there, and I'm, she's got loads of pictures and told me all about it. Too. But, but that was really um, very, very good. Very good. Good, good stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. No, I really appreciate you, that, Goff. Um, right, Eleanor... Um, with somebody who's actually been there, um, who's been engrossed in the culture, um, if you'd like to disagree with anything, I'd like to hear it. Or if you'd like to agree with it, uh, then it's fine. What, what would you, what areas would you disagree with and why? Um, no, I think it's uh, all very, it's, it's all brought it back to my mind, you know, memories. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, a, a photograph of that stone yes, I was talking yes. about. Wow. 12 sided if you count all the little bits, so you know, zigzagging. That's in Cusco. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, and uh, well, I think there's, I took a photograph in a museum of, I think, uh, um, what's his name, Bingham. Uh, do, do you know what? Keep, keep that on there, right? What I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a bigger screen. Hang on a minute. Uh, keep, keep, put those two images back up again quickly. Go. Talk. Oh, uh, uh, there's the. Uh, there's the one, can you see it, that one? Yeah. The, of the stone in Cusco. Um, let me see, uh, sure. But that's, that's in a museum, I right? show <laughs> of um, Bingham, when they, they discovered, and the state of it, there's a photograph here somewhere of the state of the place. Oh yes, there you are. I think that's, uh, it was pretty well overgrown. Mm. Um, Give us one more, Anna. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, do, 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 do. that's just a little bit of a. Oh, I've got one of where there's an earthquake and it's um, uh, the, shut, the stone has been shaken, but it's not collapsed. Uh, oh, that's just a picture of the men working on the site to restore some of the stonework that's been worn away. And they're using traditional sort of methods of, they don't use cement, but it, the, whatever it is that they use um, in, in keeping with the way that um, it was done traditionally. 
Um, give us one more. Yeah, uh, okay, let's just see if I can. I'm trying to find the one with the. Um, what, what I'll do, Ellen. Oh, what, what, yeah, what, yeah. What, that's what, just a pathway walking along, a pretty rough stone. Um, oh, here, here it is, I think. Uh, give it went up to the Sun Gate as well. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of walkway along a cliff that the Incas used to travel carrying goods and it's abs uh, frightening. There's no protection and it drops about a thousand feet down. I hope you didn't walk that. Oh, I walked just near to it, um, but no further. Um, that's an overall picture of the site. And um, uh, da, da, da. oh, here, are. here it is. So you can see some of the walls being uh, collapsing. I think that was due to a earthquake or something. But they're still still held together. Thank you, thank you for that, Alan. Now, you know the last image yeah. that you showed us. That that yeah. basically that shows that's the later that's the later bill, but it still is. Oh, right. yeah. No, when I say not the later bill, that's probably from about about the fifty. Uh, this is that again, fourteen nineties, fifteen hundreds, when the blocks are a little bit smaller. But then again, that's still kept together. That has still kept together. So that that bears yeah. out what I've said. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you okay. for that. Thank you, okay. thank you for that, Eleanor. Right, um, yeah, Keith. Anything you'd like to say, quick? No, I don't. how high up was uh, Machu Picchu? Um, it's lower than where you think, actually. Which is I, quite, I, I, um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer. You, to you go up a uh, uh, road in a uh, bus, which has got terrific drops on either side, but it's actually not as high as I thought it was to right. be. Right. Okay. Oh, very interesting. I think anyway. it's lower than Cusco. I think it's lower than Cusco. Oh. Hmm. And uh, right, thank you for that, Keith um, and Eleanor. Um, Rosamond, anything? And keep to with me at the end as well, Ros. Yeah, anything quick? Yeah. What, what was the name of the place you said before Villa Camber? I, I couldn't catch the name of the place. Um, that was um, Oyan Taya Tambo, which is O O L L A N T A Y T A M B O or O I L. Um, a N T A Y T A M B O Oya Tambo, which is the great vic um, Inca victory. Uh, right, How so did we get the stones up there, Carl. How, were the stones already up there? Are they hacked no, out of um, the rock? There's there's talks of some of the sites where they they would quarry one mountain side and move all the stuff up to the other mountain side. I've heard those okay. few things. Yeah, no, that, that, whatever stone is available, they would use if it's no good then they're going to bring it in. Um, right, so we haven't heard from um, uh, Jim quickly. We can't hear you, Jim. You're not undoing your mic. Right, whilst you're doing that, I'll go quickly on to um, Sue and Terry. I'm vividly told, and um, disease wins the day again. Well, it, it, <laughs> always, it always wins the day, and Eleanor just showed you the spelling as well. Um, yeah. Nothing... There we go. Show it. There it is, R Rosamond. Um, keep it up on the screen. And anything you'd like to say, Terry? No, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Very interesting. Looking forward um, to the next. That you're very welcome. Very welcome. And um, I, I haven't heard yet from Jim at all. But Karen and um, Karen and um, Kathy, yeah, okay. come on. Let's have your stuff quick. What's that, Jim? No. I'll just say that apparently, because uh, the Incas didn't have written records, we were told that Hiram Bingham has basically decided everything to do with it. When he was uncovering it, he was saying, oh, this was where this happened, this was where that. And, and you note I disagreed with that, exactly. He, he, he was, <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. You know, Hiram Bingham is, is not a god anymore. He used to be a god. <laughs> Um, and because no archaeologists would disagree with him, but when with with the later stuff I was saying about the collapse of Incan civilization uh, was already taking place, and then by and the interesting what Jane said about the fact that you know what about Machu Picchu just being one of those places that um, was like a normal settlement, you know, just because it was hidden and Harren Bingham found a site that no Western had ever been to before, it doesn't mean to say it's, it's one of the last holdouts of the Incan civilization. Mm. That's a really good point, a very firm point there. Um, and Jim, we haven't heard from you at all, so come on, Jim, anything? No? All right, then. Um, so I've really appreciated 
we'll keep those in like it. Um, that, that's uh, that's going to be from um, yeah, um, yeah Cor uh, Cor 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 you can view right through, it's the precision with which they built. Trapezoidal shite type windows, beautiful, and even the doorways. You've got the view lined up right through the building. Mm. Nice. To the nice. next one. Exactly. Um, right, I, if anyone else has got anything else to say, fine. Anyone wants to have a chat at the end, then fine. But if not, I will see you. Um, some of you might see, might see you tomorrow, um, Friday. It's YouTube. Uh, you, you'll get a link sent email to you anyway, so that'll be good. Uh, if not, I will see you all next week. We look forward to next week. Anyone joining us on Saturday as well and on Wednesday. Um, next Wednesday, we're doing Welsh mansions and things that go bump in the night. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Keith, Eleanor, Rosamond, Goff, Jane, um, Sue and uh, Kathy, Eleanor, Karen, and that witch, <laughs> Kathy. See you guys. Bye, bye. Bye, Daddy. 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 Bye, Thank you. I, I get sloppy in my thing. I should say, did you enjoy today? And Keith says, no, he, he, he hated it. Good. Um, it, it, brought back mem it brought back Rubbish. memories of the place. You know, you reminded me of the places. <laughs> And, and to, to be honest with you, even even if you're just looking at the images, um, it, it, it does bring back memories. And it, it actually, uh, to be honest with you, you know, people say in life you should have no regrets, and that, that's going to be one. You know, I, I um, yeah, I, I would. I had all the. Here, Carl. I had all to arrange an archaeological Camry trip there, Carl. I don't think we're going <laughs> to. I'd like to, to do the, uh, the the Inca Trail up to the. Yeah. <laughs> I did a bit of it, but not much. Uh, <laughs> up, to be to honest, sun, up to the sun gate. <laughs> to be honest with you, Eleanor, I'd prefer to fly into, say, Cusco and then just uh, um, try and walk. Oh, I love there. Cusco. Cusco is yeah. wonderful, I thought, yes. And just walk the whole thing. You know, I don't want to... I, I know you went on the bus because you're part of a tour and all the rest of it and, and so on, but, uh, but no, I, I, a... I'd want to walk. We flew everywhere, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And were the local planes any good? Oh, yes, fine, yes. Cusco is, is quite high, actually, really high. Yes. You need the uh, old cocoa drink, <laughs> which usually is laid on <laughs> freely in the hotels for you, you know, to drink. Yeah, no, so I, I, I can imagine. It's higher than Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu? Yes. It's lower than, I'm sure, lower than Cusco. I'll have to look that up. Do, do you know what we're going to do? What we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to put, get that, I, I, do, you know, when you, do, when you do something like this, and um, if I was doing a lecture specifically on Machu Picchu, I'd be able to work that one out. I'm just typing in uh, Machu Picchu facts. Um, let, let's, let's, let's work that one. Here we go, 7,000 feet above sea level. Right, and what's Cusco? Um, I, I, I'm actually thinking that you're right. I seven think oh no, 7,000 has got to be the highest point in there, not where the, I can't believe that. It's, it's 7,000, that's 21, 7,000 feet or 7,000 meters? No, 7,000 7, feet. Oh, feet, right, right. okay, fine. What's Cusco? And, and the problem is you're going to have to do your maths here, right? The measurements for Cusco were 3,399 meters. So that's... Yes, it, it, is, it is higher. That's nearly, that's nearly 12,000 feet. Exactly. That is right. about 12,000 feet. Yeah, I was right, yeah. Hey, you yeah, can. Yeah. <laughs> you are. Yeah. Oh, hang on. If you want to compare... Um, yeah, that's, that's right. It, it's, it's, it, it's saying that. Yeah. It, oh, here we go. 11,200 feet. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 11, so, uh, oh, that's a ni nice fact yeah. to have. Yeah, yeah. But when you get to the, the town at the bottom of Machu Picchu, you, you, you go up in a, a coach um, and you think, well, you are going a, that much higher. But of course, you've come down from um, Cusco. Mm. Yeah. Right. So do you yeah, have a head for heights to go there? <laughs> oh, well, 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 I was amazing sitting on that bus and looking. I, I deliberately Ooh. tried to look, sit, sit the other side. <laughs> yes. Oh, it was horrendous. <laughs> Oh, wonder, it's a wonder there weren't more accidents, or weren't accidents there. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I don't even think about it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it was a wonderful experience, I must say. Mm. Yes. And I've just come back, of course, from South... What's interesting, come back from um, 
uh, South America uh, five weeks and only just got back in time before the uh, shutdown, wow. uh, lockdown. Um, that was a close got shave. Back on, went on the 15th of uh, February and came back on the 20th of March and uh, did right down from Santiago down to Tierra del Fuego and back up through um, Argentina up to uh, finally um, uh, not Sao Paulo, it's um, Rio de Janeiro, yeah. And uh, But I noticed that whereas in um, Peru there was a lot of history put forward to us of the Incas, etc., you know, um, in in all the tours that we went on, it, you didn't get that in Chile. So presumably the, the effect of the um, Spaniards and, I don't know, down there was not the same. They don't talk about it so much. I don't know why that is. It, it, but 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 you have had you have had uh, political um, very political and military governments that may have actually hidden that and hidden it yeah, yeah that's yeah. right of course the biggest influence of the Spanish is uh, the language of course oh yeah all speaking you know Spanish my yeah. my granddad used to say he used to ask, my granddad asked me a question once he said um, what's the most well spoken language on the world and that's in the world I said English Spanish he said, and he said no it's Spanish. It is Spanish. I didn't realize how much in North America uh, they speak Spanish. Yeah, they did. Like California and, and Florida. Exactly. And if you want to get anywhere in, uh, in uh, government uh, positions or whatever, you know, top positions, you've got to be bilingual, uh, yes. English and Spanish. Mm. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, no, it's one of those things. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Oh, very interesting. Okay, well, thank you for that. So, uh, Many thanks it, for that. It, it, it brought back memories. <laughs> no, I, I can tell. I can't. I can tell. I, look at my photos. <laughs> oh, no, those photos were valuable. And I tell you what, if you want to join us next week, then you're very welcome. Okay, thank you. If, you, if you've been to Istanbul or, or, or Byzantium. No, I haven't been. There's somewhere I want to go. I've just, you know, yes, I've been in a lot of places. But uh, and when I we went to Istanbul. Peru, we went to the Galapagos as well, you know. Oh, now, come on, you're showing off now. <laughs> and, and this time I went to Easter Island. Oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> oh, the history that, there. Mm. That is showing off. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they, they, they sound great. No, they, 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 they yeah. like, yeah, they sound yeah. like a dream. Yeah. So. Okay. Eleanor, it's been an absolute nice pleasure. Nice to meet you, Eleanor. <laughs> a nice hmm? It was nice to meet you, Eleanor. Oh, thank and you. Yes, you that's, uh... Mac and Pick Mac and Pickle. <laughs> Mac and yes. 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 Exactly. Okay. Many thanks, Ellen. It's been a delight. Bye. Take care. Bye. Okay, bye. 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 I'm waiting for Tom to walk in the door any moment, so we might <laughs> we might get disturbed by uh, the roving sailor. <laughs>